kicking off the weekend in style. This is your homecoming with Cam Rhythm. Five four five one eight hundred is the number. It's great to have you here. Jump aboard. We've got a great show ahead for you. It has been one hell of a week weather-wise. I tell you what, it was beautiful the last time I spoke to you. I was looking out the window here. I remember I was looking at the gauge. It was about 33 degrees last time we spoke. And all of a sudden, I've got my thermal gear on. It feels like it is back in July. I hope you're well. I hope the week that has been has been good to you, despite the weather we've had to suffer through. And it seems like the news of the week this week is that the Shire is fit for the future. I believe I could have told you that before we heard this report, but at least now it is official. For those of you who know the IPART report, the Independent Pricing and Regulatory Tribunal, released this report earlier this week that has given the Sutherland Council the green light, the tick of approval as part of its total overhaul of the council network. Now, it feels like this has been a very long process, the amalgamation process, and it is a long way from over yet. But at least for many of us, the story tends to end here. Now, this report was released earlier in the week and it announced that the Sutherland Council was one of only seven councils in the entire Greater Sydney area to be assessed as viable to stand alone under the Baird government's new Fit for the Future program. The other ones include Bankstown, Blue Mountains, Camden, Penrith, The Hills and Wallandilly, as well as a couple of other proposed mergers uh, that would be part of it. Now, as part of being Fit for the Future which is a massive green light for the Shire. The Sutherland Council will have access to a whole range of benefits, including a streamlined rate variation process. There'll be a state government borrowing facility that's uh, in its works at the moment, priority for other government funding and grants, as well as eligibility for additional developed planning powers. So overall, this seems to be a massive win for the Shire and for Sutherland Council, uh, as well as all of us ratepayers in the Sutherland Shire. Uh, we do have a large council, we do have, I would say, a largely well-run council. Uh, but I will say that it doesn't appear that the same can be said for the rest of the state if there are only seven councils being given the green light here. And one thing I can tell you is that the same cannot be said across the bridge. Now, as we would have heard over the last couple of days, not at all is well around Hurstville Council and the councils in that area. There was a recommendation as part of this IPART report by the state government that has urged Hurstville Council to merge with Canterbury and Rockdale councils to form a much larger Canterbury Council that would uh, that would sweep right across the area. And, of course, all three being labelled as unfit for the future. Now, exactly what that means going forward, it looks like we're all in for a dogfight over that side of the bridge. Uh, as we heard earlier this week, reported in the leader, Cogra and Hurstville councils, along with the majority of their residents, rejected the amalgamation idea and the entire process. But it now looks like both councils may have to settle for a merger because, essentially, Hurstville Council wants no part of the Canterbury Council. I'd love to know, we do broadcast way out into those areas. I'd love to know what your thoughts are on the amalgamation process. Whether you like your council or not, I'd love to know what you think. I think across the state, there are some councils that are not as well run as others. Some may not be financially viable, some may have their own issues. Where do you think we go from this point? Because we have, as I've said, seven councils that have been given the tick of approval. That means many, many that have not. Would you like to see your council amalgamated? I'd love to know your thoughts. 94451800 anytime throughout the afternoon. As I said, today on the show, we do have quite a jam packed lineup. We've got a whole heap of things to get through, including we're going to talk football in the Shire a little bit later on. We've got a long awaited overhaul to the HSC that is on the horizon. It won't affect this year's cohort, possibly not even next year's cohort, but we're on the verge of a massive, massive overhaul to the system. And I think that it's something that students and future students will be very, very happy to hear. We're also going to talk YouTube's latest innovation and a whole heap of other things, including whatever else it is that comes to mind throughout the afternoon. As I said, if you hear a story that you think we should know about, if you've got a thought that's in your head, let it out. It is medically good for you. And you can also hit the show up on Facebook. Just type in the phrase 2SSR homecoming and you should find it. No worries. That number again, 9545-1800 at any time throughout the afternoon. I'm here till six o'clock. My name is Cam Redden and let's get the show on the road. It's Green Day to kick things off. You're on 2 double S R F M. Cam Redden and this is your homecoming on 2 double S R F M. 
It is 27 minutes past four o'clock. If you're driving home from work right now, or maybe you're driving home from somewhere, maybe you're going out somewhere, the chances are you're in one of two places. You're either stuck on the M4 or you're somewhere along the Prince's Highway, particularly if you're coming to or going from the Shire. Now, I, for one, actually kind of like the Prince's Highway. I find it relatively stress-free, so long as I know where it is that I'm going. But apparently, I am in the minority here. See, maybe using it every day for me, I I just kind of like it. I like the ease of it. I think it's convenient. It spits you out wherever you need to go. But clearly, I am in the minority, at least according to 8,000 motorists who took part in uh, a recent NRMA poll that was done, and it determined that the Prince's Highway, our Prince's Highway that connects the Shire to the world, was ranked the fourth worst, the fourth worst road in the entire state. Wow. See, I think using the Princess Highway is fantastic. I realise a lot of the the problems here are caused with upkeep or maybe some congestion, particularly around Cogra and things like that, but I actually reckon that our road is one of the better ones. Now, among the problems that were, were went along with people saying that they didn't particularly like the Prince's Highway at all were the typical ones you would expect. Your congestion problems, lane width, uh, which I think both of them are on the improve. I know there's been some work done particularly around Blakehurst there on that side of the bridge uh, when it comes to the widening the lanes. But traffic light phasing was one that has really stuck out. And I think that this is probably one, if you're sitting at a red light right now, you can certainly be a little bit sympathetic to some people's complaints. There is a fair bit of work happening around, as I said, but nine. 9545 is the number to call. What is your worst road in Sydney? Maybe you're sitting on it right now. See, I don't mind the Princess Highway. I, I find it relatively convenient. I like to drive most places where I go, and I find that that's probably the most convenient route to go uh, when there isn't public transport readily available. I'd love to know, what is your worst road in the state? Mine has probably got to be Parramatta Road. I think Getting anywhere on Parramatta Road, peak hour at 2 o'clock in the morning, it doesn't matter where it is, it is an absolute hassle. And I know there has been some talk for a while now about the F6 or putting a freeway through Miranda. Whether or not that is a solution to people's problems with the Prince's Highway, I'm not quite sure. Personally, I'm not 100% sold on it, but I'd love to know your thoughts. 95451800 is the number to call. Taking your calls right throughout the afternoon... Gee, I don't know. I, I am one of the, the Prince's Highway's greater fans, but if you disagree, let us know. Cam Redden, and this is your homecoming on 2 SRFM. It is half past four. In just a moment, on the other side of this, we're going to talk to the president of Football Sutherland Shire, of the Sutherland Shire Football Association, about a late, well, which you call it a leak? I don't think quite you'd call it a leak, but it's probably another development in this plight that many of us have, and I would call myself one of them, that are pushing for an A-League team into the Sutherland Shire. Now, we're going to find a little bit more about it after this song, but I'd love to know your thoughts. Jump on the phone, 95451800, just in principle, without knowing anything else about it. Would you like an A-League football team in the Sutherland Shire. You can email as well, cam.2ssr at gmail.com. We're going to jump into all that right on the other side of this. Cam Redden, and this is your homecoming on 2 SRFM. It is 25 minutes to 5 o'clock. You may remember some rumours surfacing last year that linked Tim Cahill's star soccer to a potential A-League team established right here in the Sutherland Shire. Well, while the odds of Tim Cahill calling Cronulla home anytime soon look to be fading somewhat, a report this week released in the Sydney Morning Herald makes it look slightly more likely that our own Sutherland Shire may just end up getting its own A-League team, and the dream may well still truly be alive. On the line is Wayne Schweichel. He is the president of the Sutherland Shire Football Association. G'day, Wayne. G'day, Cam. How are you going, mate? Very well, mate. Look, I really appreciate your time on the show this afternoon. I want to ask you, first of all, is this a reality? Are we in the realm here? Is this a chance of actually coming together? Yeah, it's quite possible that it could come together. <clears throat> There's been some uh, conversations over the last 18 months or so um, heading in this direction with uh, positive conversations involving um, Football South Coast, the St George uh, Local Football Association, uh, local council um, and Football uh, Australia as to um, to see if there's a possibility of basing a A-League team 
somewhere down in this area. What's the mood been in those sort of conversations? Are, are they all are all parties rather confident that this is something that will happen, even if it's not say for next season, but somewhere down the line? Yeah, everybody's really confident and positive towards um, bringing it together, and by collectively working together, um, we should be able to come up with a, a solution that um, that sees the A League team based here somewhere, as I said, in this area. I know I'm certainly a fan of it, and I know we've we've heard this week um, our new mayor Carmelo Pesky, Kent Johns are all massive fans of it. What what is the feel you've got from the grassroots area? Is there a real passion in the Shire for a team here? Oh, definitely, definitely, and, and it would be one thing. Um, especially for the Sutherland Shire that uh, with 18,500 registered players to have a local uh, A-League team that they would support, be able to call their own, or they would have had a really good um, association with Sydney FC, um, just to get behind a local team. Now, and again, that goes for St George, as I said, and, and yeah. for Football South Coast. Absolutely. I suppose the most important aspect to all this is building the community around it, isn't it? Because you can't just have the the senior club and then expect everything to just fall into place under it. It has to be really networked here, doesn't it? That's correct. And and that'll be part of us as the association working with yeah. um, whatever the A-League team is and supporting them, getting behind them, and then obviously they coming into the local community and supporting our local clubs and our grassroots, play, our grassroots players, I should say. Um, and encouraging them to get behind the sport. Fantastic. And and also, if you think about it, even from a wider perspective here, this would add, say we get our, our Sutherland Shire side, this would add another six derbies for the A-League season in Sydney alone. That would be enormous, not just for football locally, but I would have thought for the state as well. Oh, definitely, yeah. It, look, you think of the uh, monetary value that would bring into the local community. Oh, yeah. Um, to the local businesses. Um, you'll have a, it, 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 for instance, if it was in um, the Sutherland area and we looked at a facility, it may be uh, Ramonda Stadium, so yeah. there's a, a facility that's not used during the summer months. Um, but again, um, looking at, at a holistic view, again, you've got a Wollongong and St George. So look, we're, we're supportive of it. Um, if it. If it comes to Sutherland Shire, that's a great thing. If mm. it happens to go elsewhere, but we will still support it because it's only going to benefit um, football in this part of Sydney and um, and all local grassroots players. And it's grassroots driven. Oh, so that's oh, that's yeah. the main thing. And it comes like that way when we talk about any sort of club, isn't it? Because it, it's a real community centre. We look at what the Sharks do even just around the Shire as an example and it becomes a real hub for community. So it's a lot more than just the sport, isn't it? That's correct. And it's, it's the locals identifying with something local yeah. that they take ownership of and take pride in. And it, and it builds and grows from there. And, and I can only see a benefit and a positive uh, um, aspects coming out of this. I couldn't agree more. I'm certainly one of the hopes to get it. So I want to ask you, as president of the, the Shy Football Association, how's the season been so far? I believe the season's just about wrapped up now, isn't it? Yeah, it's been really good. Um, we've just actually just finished the last state league competition last weekend with our, one of our local clubs, Martin. Their women 30As were champions of champions. Oh, remember? Really Within Football New South Wales, they were the uh, they were the gun team in that age group. You beauty. Uh, we had a number of other teams that uh, all age men's twenty ones that got through to the finals as well, but they weren't successful. But uh, we have been successful on, on a number of levels. Our women's Premier League from our social uh, sorry from our, our shire based yeah were successful in a number of competitions and uh, one of them going through and winning that competition. Um, so we we do have a really good strong grassroots based local uh, association and uh, it goes through and shows with the success against other uh, associations and teams from other areas. That's exactly so. what we want to hear. So hopefully the ball is rolling. Hopefully we can get there. I really do appreciate your time on the show, Wayne. I, I want to ask you one last question before yep. I let you go. If we have to come up with a name here, what are we uh-huh. leaning towards? We've got the uh, Sharks here. It's got to be something else. Look, I I don't know. Um, I would like to see something that relates to the southern area of, of say, Sydney, and, yeah. as I say, and including um, Football South Coast and St George. What it would be, I don't know, but I think it would have to be something southern-related, which would mm-hmm. be a great thing. Um, and to identify them on their own, it could be something uh, southern stars. I don't know. Oh, I example. like that. That's but not bad at something all. Something that I think needs to set them apart from... Um, uh, other codes, maybe like uh, rugby league, yeah. um, set, set, them, set them apart, but have them that they identify with the area, uh, uh, but they stand alone. So something along those lines would be great. Um, that'd, that'd be good. 
I like it. So the the steps are put. Hopefully we are on the right track. Wayne Schweichel, president of the Sutherland Shire Football Association. Really appreciate your time on the show, mate. And uh, enjoy the off-season. I hope you don't work too hard. Oh, thanks very much. Any time at all. Good luck. Thanks. Good on you, Wayne. Thanks. Bye-bye. So there is your take-home assignment for the weekend. What do we call the Sutherland Shire A-League side. You heard there Wayne Schweichel, president of the Sutherland Shire Football Association. The steps are being put in place here. This is not within, this is not without or um, beyond the realms of possibility here. This is a very real chance of happening. And we've heard talk over the last couple of days and even the last couple of weeks that the Wellington Phoenix A-League side are just about on their last leagues. Now, a few years ago, they did have their own financial problems. They recovered from those and they've put together a couple of respectable seasons in the in the league, in the A-League. But one of the main arguments here is that having that one New Zealand side and being called the A-League here possibly from a, uh, an Australian biased perspective, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing, but I think the FFA's main problem with this is that having that one New Zealand team really doesn't benefit Australian football in any way. There's no real way to, to develop Australian talent. Now, I am very much a fan of having the New Zealand side in the competition, but I tell you what, if I had to choose one or the other, I would much prefer the Sutherland Shire to have our own side that we could barrack alongside the Sharks. For a long time, we have been a one a one sport, a one code, and a one team town. And I love the Sharks as much as anyone else, but I think having a soccer side in the Sutherland Shire representing us would be brilliant. We're going to chat a little bit later on to Stu Redmond, host of Sideline Eyes on a Sunday afternoon on this very channel and we're going to have a chat about it. I want to ask him and I want to ask his thoughts. I want to ask your thoughts as well. 95451800. First of all, an A-League side in the Sutherland Shire. Yay or nay? And secondly, what do we call it? Southern Stars I like. Southern Sharks. Mm, we've already got a Sharks in this area, don't we? Open your creativity. Get your paintbrushes out and blow my mind. 9545-1800 is the number to call. We're going to keep the show rolling along all afternoon. It is five minutes to five o'clock. I've won a little battle recently and I want to share it with you. I have, for a very long time on my phone, been claiming that the Facebook app has been draining my battery like crazy. And not just my battery, it has been clogging up gigabytes worth of memory. Now, I've got one of the old 4S, it is old now, isn't it? Gee, one of the old iPhone 4S models. It's, uh, I believe it's a 16 gigabyte one. And I've copped a little bit of flack from some friends of mine for deleting the Facebook app some months ago because I claimed that it was chewing up my battery and chewing up my memory like crazy. Well, it just so happens that I've had a bit of a moral win here because Facebook has now been forced to apologise for their iPhone battery draining issues that have been mostly, I would say, caused by the Facebook app. Let me read this to you. It says here, this is in the Sydney Morning Herald today, that Facebook has apologised for bugs in their app which ate up the user's iPhone battery power even when they weren't actively using the app. Incredible. It has released what appears to be a partial fix in the latest update, which, mind you, I haven't got yet. And I don't intend to be getting either. Because when you actually go, I encourage you to do it now. Just go, if you have one of these iPhones, go into your settings, look at your usage and see just how much the Facebook app is taking up. See, when I realised, I think mine got to a stage where it was about three or four gigabytes. It was around about there. So I had all my history, all my everything was in that app. And the amount of space you can actually clear up on your phone when you just use it through your internet browser is astonishing. And really, I think it's you'd be silly in a way not to because you've got all this space, all this space you can clear up and it can really be put to good use. In a post on their Facebook page, Facebook have a Facebook page, I find that kind of funny, Facebook engineering manager Ari Grant said that an updated version of Facebook's iOS app would, quote, bring improvements, some improvements, to the battery life. Now, I tell you what, I am a little bit sceptical, and I think I have a good reason to be a little bit sceptical. 95451800, what do you find about the Facebook app? 
Do you use it? Do you not use it? Do you use it through your Google Chrome like I do? Anyway, the show carries on. It is three minutes now to five o'clock with the news coming up in just a moment. This is a song by Dragon. It sums up the week, I believe. We're going to be back for more after the five o'clock news. But in the meantime, this is Rain. 9545 is the number as the show rolls into the second hour. If you missed my chat at 4.30 with Wayne Schweichel, who is the president of the Sutherland Shire Football Association. It'll be on the website after the show. It'll also be on the Facebook page to SSR Homecoming. You can get it all through there. We had a great chat about a potential Sutherland Shire A-League site. A-League, of course, being the soccer league in Australia, football for those who uh, prefer the term, I suppose. And we had a good chat, and I, I think there is a lot in this. And I would love your calls on it. 95451800. Should we go ahead with a, a Sutherland Shire A League football team? And if we should, which I certainly think we should, the hell do we call it? We've got the Sharks here. We had a, a suggestion earlier, the Southern Stars that I like. Stingrays, I heard in a conversation with a friend before the show. So the names are out there, and I'd love you to get creative with this because that's what it's all about. If it's going to be a team from the community, I think we need to really get the community to rally around it. So lend us your ears, 95451800. Uh, throughout the hour, we're going to take a look at a whole range of things, including a rearrangement of the federal electorate boundaries around the Shire, Depending on exactly where you are in the shire, you may just be voting for a new candidate come the next federal election. We're also going to take it YouTube's latest innovation. Now, this one's going to cause a little bit of controversy, I dare say. We're talking about YouTube, we're talking about ads, and we're talking about your wallet. So don't go anywhere. We're also going to chat to Stu Redmond a little bit later in the hour all about what's happening in the world of sport coming up this weekend. Stu, of course, the host of Sideline Eyes on 2SR between 7 and 9 on a Sunday night. Anything that's on your mind, 95451800. My name is Cam Redden. I'm here until 6 o'clock. Cam Redden, and this is your homecoming on 2SR 99.7, the sound of the Sutherland Shire. Yes, it certainly is. 25 minutes past 5 o'clock. I hope your Friday is progressing as you would like it. A reminder that anyone travelling to the city tonight is up for a little bit of a hassle by the sounds of things. Now, as you may remember, today or tonight is the deadline for the closure of the first section of George Street. Now, this is part of the new light rail and the complete overhaul that is going ahead in the Sydney CBD, which is going to completely change the way that we get around there. So a reminder, at 8 o'clock tonight, that is the cutoff, and that section runs from Market to King Street. Now, you may remember there was a, a change a couple of years ago now. I'm certainly not uh, old enough to remember it well. Back in the Olympics in 2000, where there was a slight closure for two weeks to reroute uh, traffic around the city. Uh, but now, as you may remember, it is all changing. It's all changing, and I would like to think for the better too. So this is the first section that's closing tonight on George Street uh, at 8 p.m. So <laughs> don't bother driving in, I would say. You would might want to catch a, uh, a train or something of that sort, and there'll be another strip closed between Market and Park Streets, but that's happening on December the 3rd. So it's all happening in the city. All the details, of course, once again on livetraffic.com. You can get all the updates there. And hopefully all things going to plan. This is going to be a real improvement, I would say. A real move in the right direction for transport in our city. Cam Redden, and this is your homecoming on 2SSR FM. We're going to talk sport in about 15, 20 minutes' time with Stu Redmond. And uh, I want to ask him what he thinks of that chat I had with Wayne Schweichel earlier in the day about Sutherland Shire getting an A-League team. I like it. I'd love to know your thoughts as well. 95451800 is the open line number. You may have noticed lately, or you may have heard today, that YouTube are jumping into the Netflix boat of things where they are starting to now not only invent a price or I would say implement a price onto YouTube, but they're actually asking for quite a bit here. On top of all the other subscriptions you're now paying, so your Netflix and your rates and whatever it may be, I want to ask you this question. Would you pay another $10 per month to use YouTube's premium subscription service? Now, for many of you who are using ad skipping or ad blocking programs on your computers to bypass the ads that are just really a part of using YouTube these days, YouTube is now offering a premium service called YouTube Red. YouTube Red. I think this is really a bit of a nail in the coffin for YouTube where they're kind of putting the white flag up to all those people who have just been installing this little thing you can get off Google Chrome. 
But I suppose the general gist here is to get content creators uh, a, a more consistent, a more reliable source of income. Because at the end of the day, many YouTubers use that, use making videos on the online platform as a full-time job and as a career. Now, at the same time, I suppose there is a, a good reason to argue that they do need to be paid for some of the hours that are the that people are putting into making this original content. And some of the stuff you can find on YouTube that is, quote-unquote, amateur material is very professionally done. And there is some serious content on there that is of a very, very high quality. And I suppose the argument goes here that if YouTube don't implement something like this, then many of those people will go out of business, for lack of a better term, and there will be no more content. Now, as I said earlier, YouTube are now launching this YouTube Red in the US next week. And as a part of that, Google is offering a free 30-day trial. And it's bundled with a, a whole thing about Google Play Music and all that sort of thing. You can subscribe and vice versa. But gee, I, I'm not 100% sold on this. I mean, when we're already paying, particularly those of you who use a streaming service like Netflix or Presto or Stan or one of those types, would you be willing to pay another $10 a month to get your content on YouTube? I think that's an interesting question. I really don't know. As someone that hasn't taken the dive into Netflix or Stan or one of those things yet, I'm a little bit unsold to pay $10 a month to access YouTube content. I really am a little unsold. Oh, having said that, though, I suppose that is just the business model of the 21st century. There are no Netflix stores that are going to be opening. It is all streaming online. And I suppose if people are going to the lengths to get around ways that revenue can be made from these things, well, maybe YouTube are in the right here. Maybe they have no choice but to implement this $10 a month charge. I'd love to know your thoughts on that. 94451800. And even just on that general trend thing here, when we talk about your Netflix and your stands, I remember I, I went up to Miranda Parkside a couple of days, or it would have been a couple of weeks ago, to rent out a DVD. And having not gone there for a couple of weeks, I thought I'd just rock up, get a movie I'd like. I've Googled all my stuff on IMDb. I know what I want. I rock up and it's shut, closed down. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a little bit sad, I think. I know Netflix is wonderful and everyone seems to have an opinion on it, but I'm just not sold yet. It just doesn't quite take my fancy at this point. If you can convince me one way or the other, 9545-1800, I really would love to know your thoughts on this and whether or not you think YouTube are doing the right thing here by putting a $10 price tag on their content. <laughs> We also learned earlier this week, and this is one for the students out there. I know it is in the middle of the HSC at the moment. Don't worry, I've been through it. I know what it's like. But we did learn earlier this week that the Board of Studies, or what is known now as BOSTES, it's a, a long abbreviation. I don't really know why they changed it. I thought Board of Studies was fine. But regardless, the Board of Studies is now planning to dump the abstract area of study from the HSC English courses. Now, this is the one that produced such academic gems as the Journey Unit and the Discovery Unit. And for those of you of my, my vintage, God forbid, belonging. <laughs> just makes your stomach churn even at the word. Uh, it's a very interesting issue, this, and I think we talk a lot about the need for more creativity when it comes to schools, when it comes to universities, and the general education process as a whole. And I think even when I went through the HSC, this belonging unit, it did become a bit of a grind in the way that it just became a repetitive process of, say, you find this quote from this text, you memorise it, you chuck it in an essay, and off you go. Everyone is happy. And I think it is time for a little bit of a change. I know uh, the, the recent module has changed to, I believe it's Discovery now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just not sold on this unit of study. And I think, for one, that it is a rather good idea that it's gone. A good friend of mine is a tutor. Uh, he's recently out of school as well. And he said that many of the students he'd been spoken to, or that he was tutoring, said exactly the same thing. They said it has become so formulaic, that unit of study, that it isn't really about learning anymore. It is just about getting as many quotes from as many sources as you can, putting them all in an essay and hoping that it ticks all the boxes to get the mark. You may remember if you have done the HSC in the last couple of years, or even if you're doing it now, that one of the key 
parts of that unit was the creative writing section, which I feel in itself is a little bit of a faux pas when you're forcing people to be creative in a 45-minute exam hall. What I would like to see here is some sort of really engaging creative section. They already have at this part of the HSC uh, the essay components and the research components. That's already there. I think this opens up a real opportunity to students and to teachers to be a little bit more creative here, to to encourage kids to think outside the box rather than looking for quotes or looking for dramatic techniques in Hamlet. We're looking here at the extension science subjects as well, and it, it looks like the HSC is probably due for an overhaul as well. It's one of those things that uh, is a cause for debate, and I think there's good reason for it as well. If you're going through the HSC at the moment, or if you've been through it in the last couple of years and you did one of those horrendous oh, topics like belonging and discovery or journeys or one of those things, I'd love to know what your thoughts are. 9545-1800, should we keep it? Should we dump it? Are you just glad you don't have to do it all again? As you may have noticed this week, it is that time of the year. It is that time of the electoral cycle, as a matter of fact, where we take a second look at the boundaries of each federal seat. Now, the new zones that were released earlier in the week, and I believe they are still in their proposal stage, so these aren't completely locked in yet, but they are arguably the most significant changes to the shire seats that we've seen in quite some time. So the plan at the moment is that the Cook electorate which takes most of the Shire, is actually going to move north across Tom Ugly's Bridge and across the Georges River to take in the waterfront areas of St George under these new proposed boundary changes for the federal election next year. Now, under this proposal plan, Cook would gain just over 5,000 voters from the Banks electorate, which includes Kyle Bay, Blakehurst and Connells Point as well. It would also gain a further 22,500 thousand voters from the Barton electorate, which includes your Cogra, Beverly Park, Cogra Bay, Cars Park, Blakehurst, Sandringham and all the areas around there. So your Ramsgate, San Susie as well. So approximately 31,000 voters who previously voted in Cook as well would then be shifted out towards the Hughes electorate, which is currently taken by Liberal Craig Kelly, who was on this station just a few days ago. The suburbs there that are going to be moving to Hughes, your Bonnet Bay, Como, Janali, Caravan Head, Oyster Bay, Carilla, Sutherland, Kirawi, Loftus and Grays Point, among others. So there's a significant change there, particularly when you have such a large section of the electorate moving from one to another. As I said, about 31,000 voters now moving from Cook into the Hughes area. So a massive change there. And I, I think this is kind of an interesting one because when you map this out, you have Cook taking the, ma the majority of the Shire, I would say, from Cronulla, most of the way up to the bridge. And then you go over the bridge up towards your Cogra and Ramsgate and all that area as well. So that'll be under Scott Morrison. But where I think this is a little bit peculiar is as soon as you cross the bridge, you drive past the Southgate shops. If you turn right at any point whatsoever there, through Carilla, through Como, what have you, you're in a completely different electorate. Now, my problem here exists not so much in the fact that they have been changed, because I understand the boundaries are constantly changing, but I just find it a little bit peculiar that you can cross one side of a road and be in a completely different electorate. Now, we have a very similar situation in the state electorate here in Gymere, where if you cross one side of Gymere Road, you're in Eleni Patinos's Miranda, but if you're on the other side, you're with Mark Speakman in Cronulla. And I just find these invisible barriers where there doesn't really seem to be any logic behind it a little bit peculiar. And a second thing to that, I don't think that just because these areas like Cogra are on the train line means that they should all be in the same electorate. I don't know. I'd love to know your thoughts. 95451800. So those suburbs that I read out, what do you think if you've been moved electorate for the coming federal election? I think the problem here really exists in how you cater to everyone within that sort of electorate. Because if you think about it now in Cook, with Scott Morrison as the member, you'll be reaching from Cronulla to Cogra with a massive slice of Carilla Sutherland smack bang in the middle that is in a completely different electorate. And I would argue that the needs of Cronulla are very different to the needs of Cogra. I think the same goes for the needs of Bundina that are very different to the needs of Como. And as I mentioned before, we do have that very similar problem at state level. I'd love to know what your thoughts are. 95451800. If you're in one of those electorates that's been moved, if you've got a new local member, if you've got a new uh, candidate that you may be having to think about for the next federal election, I'd love to know your thoughts. 95451800. <laughs> It is 
10 minutes to news o'clock at 6. Stu Redman, host of Sideline Eyes from 7 to 9 on a Sunday night, joins me in the studio. G'day, mate. G'day, mate. Uh, I tell you what, I just can't believe what a professional outfit this is. Oh, uh, well, mate, you, you've, stepped, you what, you've stepped I, into the lion's den here. I have. Like... <laughs> I've come in here and it's just go, go, go. He just rattles it off. I, I tell you what, it, yeah, I'm, I'm amazed. You, you doing a great job, If you mate. can put up with me here, mate, you can put up with me anywhere, I think. It's uh, so far so good. Now, let's talk sports, Stu. Let's get yep. down to the business end. It's been a massive week, and it's going to be a massive weekend. We can't fit everything we would like to, but I want to ask you, first of all, probably the biggest story of the week is the Dave Smith thing, leaving yep. the NRL. CEO, he'd only been there for a couple of years, was looking to make an impact. I, I would say he'd been under pressure since he essentially since he stepped into the job here what is next for the nrl where the hell do they go from here well i think it's all about uh, rebuilding the relationship with the grassroots um support mm. um dave smith was obviously in there to get uh, some business deals done whether or not he did the right thing by going exclusive with channel nine i guess all the all the free to air supporters would be mm. saying yippee you know so they get to see four games a week and not not uh, not uh, just the two, but uh, you, then you think think to yourself, um, are the NRL going to shortchange themselves by yeah. leaving uh, Fox Sports out of the deal? So, yeah, these are all the things to contemplate. But where to now? I think it's back to building a relationship with the mm. grassroots supporters, which I think were rather alienated over David Smith's rule. And one of my questions there is we've had this whole talk about centralising the sport and particularly rugby league centralising it around your home bushes or ANZ or mm. um, Allianz Stadium I can't see how we can have our cake and eat it too there when you talk about the relationship with the grassroots I don't see how moving clubs away from their suburban grounds like your Campbelltowns like your, your Shark, Shark Park, Park exactly Reminder Stadium how is that going to help in any way rebuilding that relationship if they want to ship them all into the city yeah well that's it I mean I mean, when it's so comfortable to watch a game at home, you know, the, 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 and the drinks and the food is pretty cheap at home, um, yeah. you know. And the and wedges it, are great at Shark Park too. <laughs> How good are the wedges? Oh, exactly. But oh, uh, you, you. if you're forcing people to travel 40 minutes, then get stuck in queues at a, at the mm. in the car parks and whereas... Some of them can just walk to uh, walk to the ground, particularly down at Ramondas. I mean, they've got that free transport situation they had this year. Mm. Um, why would anyone? Why would anyone want to go into town when they can go to their local ground and support I, their local team? I couldn't agree more. I, I think we've even just the, the last couple of years we've seen the Sharks whenever they've played a final in there. Just to use an example, the crowds have been poor, mm. and we've heard a lot of talk about complaining. Oh, no one wants to go in there, and I think. It's really simple that if you have a home final, you play it at home. Mm. You fit those 15,000, 16,000 in at Shark Park, you won't be able to hear yourself think. Mm. It would be phenomenal. So hopefully things can be looking up for the NRL. I want to talk uh, netball with you. Now, the Aussie Diamonds, game two, 58-48, getting up over our rivals in New Zealand. Tell Gee, you what. They, they're all right, aren't they? They're going very well. Not only that, but uh, I was a bit worried last night. The first half, uh, the New Zealanders mm. really jumped, the uh, Diamonds, and uh, I thought they were in for a real tough time. But the second half, it must have been one hell of a blitz Came screen. from nowhere. Yeah. Now, so what happens from here? It's a four-game series, so mm. the Silver Ferns now have to win the final two games of the series with a massive goal difference. I would That's like to it think it's beyond them. Goal yeah, difference, is it? it is. Yeah, so I would like to think, uh, from a biased perspective, it's beyond doubt now. Mm. But uh, gee, I, I don't want to count them out. If they're anything like at netball, they are at rugby. We don't want to count them out, but well, uh, you would you like to think that's a series win for the Aussies. Talking of rugby, you can never count their uh, counterparts out for sure. Exactly. Now, yeah, pretty you, good. You mentioned it. Let's talk rugby world cup. Sunday morning, our time. I believe it's at three o'clock. Double check your TV guides. Yeah. New Zealand take on South Africa. The Aussies are playing on Monday morning. How, how I don't know how we got here, first of all, because I remember a couple of weeks before the tournament started, we were expected to be knocked out at the group stage. All of a sudden, we're 80 minutes away from a World Cup final. Well, that's it. And... Um but uh, we've and we've done it the tough way. We've beaten yeah. pretty much all the northern hemisphere teams. Yeah. I mean, if we were looking for a grand slam, we probably would have achieved it. <laughs> I mean, sure, we weren't playing a lot of their teams at their own home grounds. We were mm. playing them in Twickenham, which is sort of a 
sort of oh we we obviously we beat the English at Twickenham so yeah. that was a good good effort but the other teams were beat beat there and not at their home grounds but uh, yeah no they're doing they're basing everything on defence and that they seem to be uh, absolutely uh, shutting down their opponents it's just about. Uh, making sure they don't make those silly mistakes. Mm-hmm. Like um, they made quite a few against Scotland, which almost came back to yeah. bite them. But uh, thankfully, uh, uh, when he needed to be, um, the, our uh, standout, standoff um, had Bernard Foley had, uh, oh, had the that ice radar man. on. The Iceman, <laughs> Bernard Foley. I remember I, I was actually, I was there lucky enough to be live when he, he played for the Waratahs in yeah. the grand final and kick that winning goal, that just sold me on Union for life. Yeah, yeah. What a player, what a sport. I just oh, love it, can't get enough of it. Mm. Uh, and finally, I, I want to ask you about Jake Carlisle. Now, mm. he's found himself in a whole world of trouble here. We're talking about this is the player who was filmed over the last couple of days. We saw the footage on A Current Affair uh, who was seen snorting some sort of white powder. Now, read into that Obviously whatever you like. baby powder. Yeah, oh, it's salt, clearly. Now... <laughs> You're a guy who's clearly got talent here. He's a talented player. You've just come from Essendon, possibly the most toxic environment in Australian sport. <laughs> what, what is going through his mind Obvi- to even put himself in a situation? Obviously, apart from that white powder. Oh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, I think that's where the problems start, mate. It's- the, the um, I think um, what it what the big big issue is, apart from his behaviour, is the behaviour of his manager. Um, where there's thoughts that perhaps he might have already known about this yeah. situation when he was dealing with the mm. um, St Kilda club. And uh, I think St Kilda are sending out a big please explain as to, uh, as to because now they've committed to exchange some of their players or draft picks in, rela- in, in return so, for Carlisle. Because they have, they have given something up for this. This isn't just a free walk-in here. Yeah. They've given up potentially great players in the future. Yeah. And... This is the first thing on day one, on day one at your new club. You haven't even met the coach yet, and this is the sort of headline that you get. And he may not even play this year if he gets That's suspended. Right. I mean, who knows? I did hear talk over the weekend that there is still a question, or over the week, I should say, there is yeah. still a, a question mark as to whether or not this will count as a strike yeah. under the AFL's policy. You've got to you've got to give the guy a fair hearing. Absolutely. You can't just sort of make a off-the-cuff... Um, Ruling on on something. I mean, the NRL got into a lot of trouble with Brett Stewart a couple of years ago when no. they when they considered him guilty before they suspended him before he actually been found guilty, and then it was uh, thrown out in court. So oh, exactly. So you, I guess you got to tread carefully, but mm. uh, yeah, it doesn't look good for Carlisle and uh, and St Kilda for that matter. I think St Kilda would be digging through their wallets for the receipt as fast as they could at this stage. <laughs> now, uh, Stu, mate, it's been great to chat. You'll be joining us every week yeah, at about quarter to. to six. And uh, I want to ask you before before I let you go, I had a chat earlier today with Wayne Schweichel, who's the president of the Sutherland Shire Football Association, and we were chatting about the possibility of a Sutherland Shire A-League side. Now, we've been searching all afternoon for a name of what we might call this. I want to ask you first, do you think this is? Do you think there's something to this? Is this an idea that... That you'd like to see? Yeah, I think so. I, I'd hate to think that it would take um, take the um, glory off the off the state side because we got the Sutherland Sharks and that, and they're rather successful. Hopefully, hopefully it won't take any tarnish off them. But yeah, it'd be great to have another side down south. I mean, we'd have someone to support during this during the uh, summer. That'll do us for today's show. Thank you to Stu for his time this afternoon. He'll be back again next week. That is it for today's show. The music is sounding. It's time for me to head out of here. I hope your weekend is a good one. I'll be back at four next week to do it all again. Cheerio.